you. <laughs> so I was here in, well not here in 2016, it was outside Guildford somewhere in a field in 2016 at EMF talking about sex robots. I just started researching them then. And I came back again in 2018 to update what was happening and to talk about the stories behind the headlines. There were a lot of headlines. And then I thought, well, why not do this again? So John D said, come and talk about sex robots again. It'll be the third part in the trilogy. I mean, I'm determined that I'll come back and do the prequel after this, but for now we'll go with this. So I want to talk a little bit about what's happened since 2016 and where it's ended up. And these are the kind of headlines that really intrigued me when I started researching this. So I'm a reader in Artificial Intelligence and Society at King's College London. So in the, the six years since my first talk at EMF camp, I've changed jobs. I used to be at Goldsmiths. So I've moved to King's and they were very accommodating and they let me keep the sex toys on my shelf in my office. Um, and they didn't kick up too much of a fuss about it. So they're very supportive. Um, so I was seeing all these headlines saying things like, this is the end of porn online because the sex robots would make a reality out of porn and that there would be real relationships. I particularly loved the Irish Sun's headline of robot wars. Um, I've tried to pitch sex robot wars at AMF camp and there was a negative <laughs> response to that. Um, and then sex robots could reveal your deepest perversions to complete strangers. And as every single person here knows, anything connected to the internet can reveal the deepest perversions to complete strangers. So I've been researching all these different sort of things. And initially I was met with lots of talk like, is that really an academic thing to do? This doesn't really count as real research and all the sort of things you might expect. And I looked at the love that we have for technology the love that we have for each other via technology, love that is mediated via technology, and people who love are in love with technology. And I say love, but I also mean sex, but then I also mean love, because it turns out it's not straightforward, and it's not just about sex. And one of the things I've learned over those years is that intimacy is really the driving force here. So sex is part of it, pleasure is part of it, but it's about closeness and companionship as well. So I've been studying things about the narratives of AI and desire. Where does that come from, this idea? Okay, um, so yeah, I've been looking at things like where the stories we tell about sex robots come from. And it's got a really long history, and if anyone heard that talk way back six years ago, there have been stories going back to the ancient Greeks about creating the perfect artificial companion. Um, stories about a woman whose husband died in battle uh, she asked for the gods to bring him back. He returned, he had to go again after three hours. She created an artificial version of him and took it to bed with her. So we have these stories that go back millennia and of course we see it in the sci-fi that we create today. Anything from the femme fatale Maria in Metropolis right through to Ex Machina, um, which is an absolutely amazing slash terrifying film that I love and yet at the same time have problems with, um, and, uh, and the film Her, which is called the gentle version where, where the operating system becomes um, the perfect companion and then decides, then suddenly you find out that the operating system loves everyone else the same way as well. It's more kind of a, uh, again, these are all kind of tales of um, dystopia. So what is the actual reality? That's what I wanted to find out, and where can it go in the future? And we were seeing all of these headlines about it being, you know, the end of sex. Um, sex robots to replace women as men can't tell the difference, which I think is very unfair to men. Um, most of them could. Uh, have we got pictures again yet? Because the next thing is to show you what these things actually look like. Um, oh, I love it. Aviation stage, eh? Sounds really cool. Uh, <laughs> so, this, but this, so what actually happened was that the state of the art, as I expected it from all these headlines, was that there would be this army of wonderful fembots, Austin Powers style, ready to take over the world. And what I actually found was there weren't any at all. So despite these headlines saying that people were marrying their sex robots, that they were 
replacing their partners with them. There was nothing. Nor is there any large-scale project to build them. So what there really is is a handful of workshops around the world, a couple in the US, a couple in China, and they are doll manufacturers, sex doll manufacturers, who are adding in some automation and some robotics into their sex dolls. And that's it. And we all know how difficult it is to make a humanoid robot. Uh, it's, it's technologically complex, it's financially expensive, it's a real engineering challenge. Why would we even go down that route? What is it about the idea of a humanoid robot as a partner that makes it so appealing? Because we know there's already a wonderful sex tech industry out there with all sorts of cool stuff happening. So why do we have to make it look like they're human and like they're female? Because this is a very gendered thing. There are a few um, male robots out there not, sorry, not robots, dolls. Male dolls out there aimed at women and gay men. But predominantly, these are reductive female stereotypes that are aimed at um, heterosexual men. Uh, so it's very gendered. And then if you look at the sex tech market, that's more interesting. And certainly in the West, the split between who's buying sex toys tends to be, well, it's, it's fairly even in, at the moment in this country, but it tends to be more uh, tailored towards women. So why is, so why is there this obsession about the idea of a figure, a, a companion, a life-size robotic partner? Still no picture? Ah. OK, so I had some pictures to show you. Maybe I should describe them that way. <laughs> I did. Imagine you're, imagine you're in Marks and Spencers, and one of the mannequins is in lingerie and propped up against a sofa. That's essentially, <laughs> it's essentially what the Roxy True Companion robot looks like. OK, so we're replacement. Oh, yeah, here we go. So I've just described. <laughs> This is the state of the art in sex robots today. Um, Roxy True Companion with a triple X on the left. She doesn't really exist. Um, she was wheeled out at a, a trade show uh, probably a decade ago, and no one has ever seen a finished version since. That was the prototype. But the, the guy who made her is incredibly litigious, so I can't say it's a complete fraud. Um, this, the middle one, uh, I'll go to the right next. On the right is Samantha. Um, Sergei Santos is Samantha. Ser Sergei doesn't, didn't make the body. He used the body of uh, a sex doll. He was interested in the AI. He was really interested in seeing if he could create a reciprocal algorithm so that the nicer you were to Samantha, the nicer she was to you and the more yielding she was. Um, so this was the goal was to try and give Samantha pleasure, and that was part of his idea. Um, he got some very negative press, which I'll come to in a bit, but he's now stopped completely and doesn't manufacture work on this anymore. And then in the middle is kind of what is closest in existence today, which is Harmony's uh, The Rail Doll X of his creations, um, creation. And she, because I do gender them, it's easier to talk that way. Um, she is a doll with a robotic head, and they're now working on some movement in the body, but essentially immobile from the neck down, can't stand up on her own. Generally, like, this is not a robot. Right? Anyone who works with robots will be going, I'm sorry, what part's the robot? But the, there is an animatronic head. This is actually quite good. Um, I'd play the video, but I can't because I'm on a PDF now. Um, but this is Matt McMullen, the creator. He, he runs Real Doll uh, of his creations. And um, we went out there in 2017 to visit. And I was really, really impressed. I did not think I would be. And yet I was. I thought it was, these are very perfectly crafted um, pieces of art almost. So on one side of me, the kind of angry feminist was getting quite hit up about the body image. But the other side of me was like, oh, that's actually quite impressive. Um, so it's, there's a very cognitive dissonance going on there. Um, this would have been the video, because if you hear Harmony talk, she has a very soft Scottish accent, which is just bizarre. Um, uh, not bizarre that she has a Scottish accent, I love Scottish accents, um, uh, but bizarre that it comes out of this robot. And it was picked because 
Matt felt that was the voice that he liked best and he thought would market best. Harmony's now um, available in different forms. So basically, you can get the doll and then you buy the robotic head and you can now apparently order the head. It takes something like 16 to 24 weeks to arrive. It fits on the bodies of their dolls. Um, and that's the, basically the closest we have. That and a company in China that makes similar um, but much less artistically crafted versions um, with similar things. Both of them have AI chatbot capabilities. So it's basically a dirty talking chatbot um, embedded in these dolls. But the interesting thing about Harmony is that there's a standalone app as well. So you can download for $20, you can download this app to your phone, to a tablet, um, currently only available in Android, <laughs> um, fittingly, even though she's a gynoid. Um, and, uh, and you can have your virtual partner. More on that later. So what happened after that? Well, um, apparently a festival of sex robots was coming to London after being banned in Malaysia for being too extreme, which was news to me because it was actually an academic conference that we were hosting at Goldsmiths. <laughs> um, so this is why I learned never put out a press release on a Friday afternoon because by the time you get to Monday morning, it's gone all around the papers and everybody's phoning you going, can I see one of these sex robots? Do you teach people to actually have sex with the robots? No and no. Um, so this was a, the Love and Sex with Robots conference was banned in Malaysia because let's face it, it's a conservative country and they weren't too keen on hosting it there. And City University in London wouldn't host it either. Um, and Goldsmiths, well... <laughs> Goldsmiths loves that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, so fucking Goldsmiths. Um, and so I was there at the time. We said, yeah, we can host it. Um, and it was really interesting. We had about 50 academics and we had about 50 journalists turned up as well. Um, and it was quite insightful. And actually, the journalists got in on the questioning too. So we were all having this dialogue going around um, with everyone getting involved, talking about it. Um, and then we got some stories came out of that. Uh, <laughs> So you try to tell people that it's a very sensible academic thing, and then you get these. Gizmodo's my favorite. <laughs> so the top one, um, I, have no, I have yet to work out how a hacked sex robot, which remember, they don't really exist, could murder people. I mean, maybe if it was wired to the mains and it put it in the bath, I don't know. Um, the sex robot molested was the story, was the Samantha robot story, and this is why Sergei doesn't make them anymore. He took the Samantha robot to uh, an electronic show and said to people, yeah, go ahead, you can, you can touch. So, of course, people were immediately going, wow, and poking and prodding. And that's what you do, you know, that's why museums put things behind glasses, you know, glass cases, because people want to, to, to touch and poke and cry with things that they've never experienced before. But it got written up as molestation. It got written up that this, this doll, this robot, was sexually assaulted um, at, at Trisha, which really wasn't the case. And he took this really badly and decided that that was it. He wasn't going to work on it anymore. <laughs> as for the Gizmodo headline, that actually did come out of our conference because we were, somebody at the conference was talking about essentially the problem with AI if you don't frame your question correctly. Um, much like Nick Bostrom's paperclip maximizer, if you give an instruction and you don't properly close the loop and tell it how to stop, then maybe it'll go on forever. So if you say to a sex robot, you must satisfy this person, um, and they keep going and keep going and keep going, yeah, things could get messy. Anyway, not a problem because remember, they don't exist. <laughs> and then we see some more headlines coming out like, um, the, the New York Times saying, oh, what we need is, a, you know, incels are talking about um, the need for uh, redistribution of sex. So you were seeing, seeing these headlines like, I mean, it's Toby Young. We were seeing these headlines like, what every incel needs, a sex robot. Okay, no. Um, just no. That's not going to work. And actually, uh, for the, bo the book I ended up writing about this, I had to spend some time on, on incel forums, um, which was not a pleasant experience. Um, but a lot of them, what I did went looking for attitudes towards sex robots and a lot of them were saying, no, this is just another cope, as in this is just another way of, of um, depriving us of sex with women because that's what they feel entitled to. 
then things got weird. <laughs> Weirder. Um, so the following year, I was supposed to run the Love and Sex with Robots conference again in London. And, you know, we booked a venue, and it all seemed to be going okay. And then about a month beforehand, a couple of months beforehand, I got this... I, I looked on the website, and I'd been taken off... <laughs> I'd been taken off the programme committee, and I'd been taken off the, the website. And I thought, that's, a bit, that's weird. And one of the main organisers, who is, shall we say... I can't think of a good word because it's not rude. Um, so, his is unpredictable. Um, he basically, he, he, he had done all this and then I kept emailing him and not getting a response and he emailed back and said, I've taken you off for your own safety because we're getting death threats from extremists. I was like, what? This is weird. I haven't heard any death threats. Which we then had to report to the Met Police because Goldsmiths didn't want to have sort of, you know, extremist targets. Um, so, of course, the police said they knew nothing about it. Um, and it got weirder and weirder. In the end, I just put out a statement saying, this is nothing to do with me, this is out of my hands, we're not involved anymore. Um, and they ended up running it in a Greek Orthodox church hall in North London, where they gave everyone coded directions to the conference via a poem. <laughs> And at this stage, I was just going, what the hell? Anyway, um, the guy who was involved with that, um, he is now inventing a death ray uh, in Malaysia. So that was his recent story in the paper. So anyway, he's not involved with the conference anymore. <laughs> so the conference actually is going, like, after a few years, everyone went, OK, this, this is too weird. So they've brought it back as an academic conference, properly run, without any weird right-wing Trump supporting death ray creators. Um, I, you, I mean, you really couldn't make this up. So, um, so it is back as an academic conference again. Anyway, I wrote a book. So I wrote a book about it, and it's called Turned On, because of course it is. Um, and it was, it was really fun to do. And um, the, the left and the second from the left are the covers in the UK. The gold one is the paperback cover. But I really, really like the Polish cover, which is the red one. I just think it's such a good cover. Love it. Um, and you can get it in German. And apparently, um, the Japanese rights were sold as well. So I think, I think it's available in Japan. But I haven't seen the cover for it. So that was good. That was fun. It was a really interesting thing to do. Um, and, it, it, you know, it's... it's an academic book, but it's a trade publication, so it's basically set up so that anyone can read it, but it's got its basis in fact. Um, but anyway, I digress. So what annoyed me about all of this sex robot thing was this fixation on this reductive stereotype of a woman's body, and I thought, we can definitely do better than that. So back in 2016 at EMF camp, I announced on the stage that we were going to run a sex tech hack. Um, and that we were going to host it at Goldsmiths, which sent poor Kevin Lewis into, <laughs> into complete tizzy because he was about to take over Hacksmiths at the time and had no idea. I was just about to throw him in the deep end. But admittedly, I thought what we were going to do was get maybe, you know, 10 people in a room and saw up some sex toys and, you know, hack them back together in different configurations. What actually happened was that the amazing Hacksmiths team Indeed, whoa, they, they are just wonderful. They put together this incredible event. They got, we had about 50 people in a deconsecrated church, uh, uh, Goldsmiths, <laughs> right before Christmas. Um, and they worked in teams of four and five. We got, we, we kind of bootstrapped the whole thing. So we got sponsorship in from sex tech companies, um, from lots of different sponsors, tech companies as well. Uh, we had musicians, artists, uh, computer scientists, um, materials, scientists, all sorts of people from all walks of life, all you know, genders, all ages. It was a real wonderful, diverse, brilliant mix. Um, and for 48 hours, um, worked on trying to break out of this idea that sex tech has to be in a particular form. We got lovely coverage as well from The Observer and The Guardian. Um, this is actually from the second one we ran, because it was so good, we ran it the following year as well. Um, Still, <laughs> still using that picture, yes. <laughs> um, and this is where I would have shown you a little video so that people who were at it could spot themselves, but I can't do that because the PowerPoint's not working, so we're on a PDF. But I will put it online and people will be able to see it. Here's more pictures. Oh, these were gifts as well. These were all animated. Um, so I had a really nice kind of boinging rainbow dildo. <laughs> it was just kind of... <laughs> 
It's not working now, what a shame. Um, but these are some of the things that, that were created. Um, so the first year, the, the, winning, um, the winning team was Lovepad, and they created soft robotics that you could place anywhere on the body. And if you squeezed the controller, which was the kind of to pump air into it, and the controller was shaped like a breast, and if you squeezed it, it would, they would curl around you. It was really lovely, and they, to, for them to have done that in the, the short space of time was just incredible. Um, one of my favorites was Peacock, which was just incredible. So this is, um, the, the motivation behind this was that you can tell um, arousal, a, a penis is erect when aroused, whereas from vagina you can't tell. But they took a vaginal egg, with, put moisture sensors on it, um, and when, when the moisture sensors activated, a big paper fan opened. <laughs> I made tweeting noises. It was so cool. <laughs> and I just think that's so lovely because not just is it a really wonderful piece of art, but it actually has, has implications for things like prosthetics too, which I just think is really, really cool. The following year, um, this one of what I called a sensuous shawl and what they called a sex blanket, um, which is this, this fabric, this shawl with sensors in it. So the idea being that if you're in a virtual or mixed reality environment and you see sort of rose petals falling from the ceiling, the sensors will activate in the shawl and you'll feel them on your skin. So it's about creating those experiences, the sensual experiences. It's not just directly um, about, um, it's, it's about intimacy as well as about sex. And it's not just focusing on penetrative sex as some kind of, you know, the right type of sex. So it's exploring and showing why sex is not just this sort of penis and vagina thing to the point of orgasm for a man that a, you know, a lot of the mainstream media take as being the default state. Um, and then, <laughs> I love this picture so much. This is by Paul Clark. And I love it because it reminds me of some kind of Victorian anatomy theater. <laughs> And that's me lying on a, a kind of a hammock with these wonderful um, inflatable tubes around me. And when you flick a switch, the tubes inflate and give you a big hug. And I just think this is just such a wonderful thing. Um, and if there was one thing that you know, I would love to have seen the whole way through lockdown would be a way to give people hugs over the internet. Um, and maybe that's you know, the closest that we can get to it for now. Um, while we're on the topic, I just want to flag a few really cool projects that are going on in the sex tech space. Um, so the um, buttplug.io is Kyle Mishoulis, um in San Francisco, uh, QDOT on Twitter. And he is doing open source, um, open source support for commercial sex toys so that sex workers will be able to have control, complete control of their data. Um, and he does lots of really cool stuff with that. Um, Internet of Dongs is um, white hat hacking for smart sex toys. There have been quite a few cases in the past few years of sex toy hacks, um, and they've been really good at um, going in and highlighting where the problems are there. And then Sarah Jamie Lewis, who um, wrote this book, Queer Privacy, a collection of essays from different contributors, um, and she's also put her, her vibrator um, on peer-to-peer uh, vibrator usage over Tor, um, so <laughs> she's really cool as well. So there's some, there's some amazing people doing amazing work in this space. But just to move on to where I think things are going to go in the future, so I keep saying, you know, this, this sex robot thing, I don't think it's ever going to really take off. And what I think is much more likely is this AI aspect and the AI companionship. So all the work I've done in, in talking to people who are likely potential users of sex robots who tend to be the people who currently own dolls, often the thing that comes across is that it's not just about sex, it's about companionship, um, and that's a big part of it. And, and certainly the standalone app that Real Doll have released would, would back that up. And um, I have a PhD student, a wonderful PhD student, Chloe Locatelli, who's working on this, and she's looking at AI and sort of post-human sex work um, and the way in which these things are constructed. Um, and in Japan, there's the gate box, uh, which is sort of virtual holographic girlfriend. And again, these are very gendered. And there's lots of questions about why is this, you know, why is this aimed at straight men? What is going on there? And I mean, unfortunately, I think it's just mirroring a lot of what Silicon Valley does as well, which is, you know, tech created by white men for white men. And, you know, we can't get away from that. There's a big power imbalance and there's a, a big diversity problem. 
Um, but one of the really lovely things from studying this for about six years is that there's now a community of academics working on the topic. So this is, I, I screenshot this this morning, uh, so there's about, you know, two and a half, nearly two and a half thousand papers, academic papers on Google Scholar that deal with sex robots. So it's starting to get some attention. And fortunately, a lot of them are also saying similar things, which is, you know, they don't really exist. Why are we getting so worried? But what can we do to make sure that we shape the narrative in a different way? And then, amazingly, there was an actual headline that sounded OK. The Washington Post said, don't worry about sex robots. They won't ruin sex. They might even make it better for some people. Remember, they don't exist. <laughs> so what's next? Um, <laughs> um, I don't know if Kevin's still here. I saw him earlier and said, I'm, I'm, can I say this, Kevin? But we, we would like to host the third installation, the third installment of the trilogy and do um, Sex Tech Hack 3 or Sex Tech Hack Menage a Trois, if you prefer. Um, we don't know where that will be, and we don't know when that will be, um, but hopefully within maybe the next year, um, somewhere. <laughs> don't know yet. Um, it would be really nice to come back to it and look at, it, look at this again. So the first year we did it based on sex, sexual pleasure. The second year we did it on intimacy and sensual experiences. The third, you know, go beyond that into things like companionship, into like haptics and touch and, and all sorts of, of things and biofeedback and, you know, take the technologies that we have, uh, the smart technologies, the smart fabrics, the um, soft robotics and, and make some really cool stuff. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's the end of my talk now. I'll be floating around later on outside if anybody wants to come and chat about this. Um, in, in true um, EMF camp style, I tried to do a QR code for my book. <laughs> um, so, no idea if I'll work on the screen or not, but I thought I'd give it a go. Um, but if you want to find out more about the stuff that I've been working on, that's what it is there. But um, I did have another slide in my PowerPoint version of kind of summary of, you know, what I learned overall. And I learned that I don't think sex robots is ever going to be a big market. I don't think um, that we need to worry about that, and I think that we've got other cool stuff happening in sex tech that's much more accessible and diverse. That I learned that the community of doll owners who have been so wonderful and supportive in all of my research are really not what you would expect. Um, I think the media has spun the tale of them being these very lonely weirdos in a basement with their, with their sex dolls. It's not that at all, and I've met some wonderful people who have really opened my eyes to that. A lot of the people who own dolls own them for a number of reasons, and sex is often secondary to that. Um, and I've learned that um, there is so much passion for doing this kind of thing, and that people are intrigued, and that we, you know, it is research. It does count as actual research. If we consider that sex is so fundamental to our existence, you know, this is what drives our species. Not everyone wants to have sex, not, but, but those who do, you know, that it can become a very preoccupying thing. So why don't we treat that seriously? Why aren't we giving it the respect it deserves? Not from a health perspective or a well-being perspective, but just from a perspective of pleasure and of intimacy. And I think that's something that, you know, we really, we really can get behind um, and say that, you know, we shouldn't make it taboo. We should be exploring how everyone can be happy in that form. So thank you very much. Thank you.